Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I think now you are joining us online. We'll give you a few seconds, and then we will kickstart this very interesting, interesting session with Janina Berner, right? Thank you very much, um, Anthony, and Merhaba. I'm pleased to be here. Salamu alaikum. So uh, the second session for this day is uh, about future-proofing workforces through transformative learning with Janina Berliner, who is the Senior Vice President for Educational Services Workforce Solutions at Siemens Healthiness, right? That's right. Uh, Janina, this topic remains a very critical... ...environment. So I'll hand it over to you to kickstart the session with what do you think is the most important factor, not only driving corporate profits, but also world economies? Thank you very much, Anthony. And you start already with a loaded question, I would say. Um, if I would have to answer, I would always say that most important is the workforce. It's the people. It's the people who are building and the people who are generating the business. And that is why it is so important that we are taking really good care of that people, that we are educating them on a regular basis, that we skill them, that we reskill them and train them, because in the end, this will add to better business results, lower costs, productivity, and by the way, really innovative um, solutions. Great. So the value of every company lies in its workforce, right? Um, at least this is my understanding that the most valuable asset a company has is really the workforce, the employees who are lifting or uplifting the company and who built the business. So we should always invest in our people uh, to, to be able to generate the best value to customers. So I believe you have prepared some slides for us, a very a few slides to, uh, to, uh, to introduce the topic. I'll hand it to you like for five minutes. Please set the, the scene and then we'll start with our questions. Sure, Anthony, thank you very much. And I brought with me uh, a couple of facts because I do believe that is very important that we do understand what are the dynamics in the markets out there? What is macroeconomic factors that are impacting the workforce of today? And one very important, oh, one very important piece of that is that you do have an aging population. We know about that, we are talking about that, but it's more than half a billion people who will be over 65 in the near, very near future. They would need healthcare. Additionally, you now have the baby boomer generation, yeah, getting into that age where you need more healthcare, where you are a consumer of healthcare as well. Plus, there is very interesting publications from the World Health Organization stating that by the year 2030, there will be a shortage of healthcare professionals of 15 million. So it's a tremendous challenge that we do see. We have an aging population and not enough people who really take care of them in a very, very skilled manner. Furthermore, I still think it's so important to not lose the human aspect, especially on the healthcare side. So how do you take care? Can you take compassionate care? It's for me, not only the competence that you could train the skills, it's also the confidence. And this number was really shocking for me. It's more than half of the people who don't believe that their skills are really good enough to take care of what they are supposed to do in their daily work. Coming to the next page, <laughs> I need to be here. If it's jumping, because there it's not jumping, now we have it, perfect. Um, furthermore, what is really important um, is that you don't stop learning. So you do learn your entire life. And listening to our workforce is so important. What are our employees thinking? And it's nearly one, two thirds that think that it's important that the employer takes care of continuous education during their career. And more than 40% would be willing to leave the employer 
if this is not happening. And here comes also then the cost position into place. If you need to replace a person who has been leaving you, it accounts to 20% of this person's salary to bring them on board. Plus, you do have the time that you need them to be trained, probably depending on the job, but it's a couple of weeks to a couple of months until they are really productive and know what they are doing. So a tremendous impact to the business of a company, of a hospital. Yeah. Um, plus, what is also important, this has been seen. If you ask um, decision makers, they do understand nearly 100%, as you could see, understand that we need to find new agile ways to really train and skill our employees, the workforce of the future, in a very personalized way. So for me, it is important that we really are using the latest technologies that are available. That is why we have been choosing um, a hybrid learning approach. It combines all the various Let's try it again. It combines all the latest technologies that are on hand to make learning and training more effective and efficient. And above all, also fun. I'm just thinking about, for instance, serious gaming. Yeah. Plus, we must not forget the human aspect. Us as human beings, we always used to learn and we never stop learning. Over the past centuries, yeah, that is how we evolved. Well, that's interesting. You have started with uh, some alarming numbers, uh, Janina. And my first question would be, seeing all these figures and these uh, numbers, who is responsible for the skilling, reskilling, upskilling journey? Is it the government? Uh, is there a need for a dialogue or a tripartite, maybe a dialogue between the private sector, public, and the education institutions? What are your thoughts on this? I do believe that um, this is really multifold. Yeah, um, it starts with the little toddlers in kindergarten. That is where I do believe um, to uh, um, primary school and then high school and universities. Government has a big part to play. Then you enter business life. There are also the companies um, that you might join. They will play um, an important role as well. Nevertheless, you as a person, you also do play an important role and you must not forget that. Yeah? Um, I just had a very nice uh, discussion with my previous speaker and he said, you know, what is the reason why most people do not get accepted by Ivory League universities? Because they do not even apply, right? So I really do believe it's the mixture that all the different stakeholders need to play together to make it possible that we have a continuous and personalized education that fit the needs on the one hand side of the market and on the other hand side, the personal um, demands. Perfect. So because today's session is about the businesses and corporates, so let's just delve further into the role of companies in generating value through this skilling journey. So how can businesses, and if you would want to reflect on Siemens, because uh, we've read a few days ago that Siemens is among the uh, top and most innovative companies globally. So congrats on that. And I think it's very important to, to look into the, this exemplary uh, company as we, we move forward. So how can businesses establish a more sustainable learning environment organization uh, to, to ensure that transformative learning is put in place? So what are you doing at Siemens and what, what other companies could do? Well, thank you, first of all, very much for the compliments. Yes, uh, we are the, uh, the best place to work. We won there a couple of awards, and I'm very proud of that. Um, I do believe it's about the learning culture that we are fostering and that we are really um, proactively developing. So it is about this continuous learning idea to give space to the employees with regards to time as well, um, but also opportunities that they could develop skills that they need, that the company needs. So we put, for instance, in place um, a really state-of-the-art learning experience platform where you could really find the matching information that you need 
um, for your job, or maybe it's your interest that you could really learn beyond what your job currently needs. It also makes suggestions. Do you want to develop in one or another position? Maybe you like then to look deeper into topic A, B, Z. Plus, what is important in this kind of digital learning platforms that they are open. So there is also the opportunity to look into LinkedIn Learn, Coursera and other platforms. That is, I believe, the mix that makes it really, really valuable for a person. And there is studies out there, a couple of minutes every day already accumulate to so much um, learning um, experience for a pe person that is oftentimes underestimated. So I can only encourage really everyone to take five to 10 minutes at least every day, read something, learn something and repeat what you have learned um, beforehand. Great, so while I was preparing for this session, I've came across some, um, you know, some uh, articles uh, regarding the private sector role in upskilling and investing in reskilling and upskilling given that it is costly, right? So they would say, why would we invest in human capital if we are we cannot guarantee retaining them? So what are your thoughts on this? Like, if why are you investing in human capital if you're not sure you're going to retain this human capital in your company? Um, I do think it's really um, an approach that needs to be taken in collaboration. And we need to co-develop, especially in healthcare, together with our customers. It's not your employee or my employee in the end. It's healthcare professionals taking care of ill people. So together with our customers, with doctors, with nurses, we are developing programs um, on how to skill, reskill and upskill healthcare professionals. We are using here, for instance, virtual realities because especially in healthcare, it is very important to create this safe space where you can practice. I mean, Probably you have had the experience being a patient in the hospital, right? Um, you are under stress. So you, you really want to have somebody who feels confident and competent and is calming you down in um, your fears probably. So you don't definitely, you don't want to be a guinea pig for let's say a surgeon yeah, who is under training. So by creating virtual realities where the surgeon could practice without jeopardizing the health of a patient. This is what we are doing. And this is only possible if you really combine the power of industries of healthcare professionals yeah, together to make this training most efficient and also effective. So reflecting on what you mentioned now, uh, the healthcare sector and other sectors, what are your thoughts on hybrid uh, learning? And why is it so important? And does it apply to all sectors? Maybe healthcare is a good example of an outlier. Um, well, I don't always want to say that healthcare is an outlier. Of course, there is other super important businesses, yeah, um, education business, et cetera, et cetera. Nevertheless, I really do believe it's important to find ways to personalize education. Um, I'm not sure, maybe you have been in that situation where you look for information online and you go to all the different MOOCs that are out there. I think I don't need to name them all. And you can't find what you're really looking for. So it's quite frustrating for you. Your learning journey, your learning experience is not really a good one. By combining all the different pieces as we do have on hand, the online training, and then probably the learning by yourself by reading or watching videos, combined with virtual classrooms where you can interact with your teacher. If you have questions, you can ask him. Plus, and this is then coming uh, really down to healthcare for me, the classroom or the hands-on training. So first you learn, you have your safe space to practice, maybe in VR, you know the protocol, the process steps, only then you could go to the vet lab yeah, and have um, a cadaver or something that you operate on. Finally, when you can do that with confidence and competence, then you treat your patients. And to repeat what you have learned is what you can condense in learning nuggets in these two, three, five minute nuggets that you read, that you listen to, or that you learn. To repeat it, 
to make it stick to you that you do not forget. Well, that's really inspiring uh, how, the, how you perceive the learning uh, at Siemens. I could tell why it's one of the most innovative and uh, enabling environment. So you've mentioned virtual reality. So maybe if we could relate it to uh, new technologies such as meta, such as the metaverse, what kind of impact could the metaverse have on education or specifically healthcare? Um, this is a question already looking far into the future, I would say, probably not too far for some of us who are familiar with the metaverse, but um, my assumption would be that uh, an average person um, is not yet so much involved in the metaverse. But just imagine you would have your avatar or your digital self in the metaverse and you have this twin there that is your educational twin. And it starts, like I said earlier, as a toddler in kindergarten. And this twin, it knows whether or not you have been to a bilingual kindergarten, that you speak German, English, Chinese, Spanish, whatsoever. And this grows with you and interacts in the metaverse with teachers, with peers, with um, whatever might be out there also in the future, generate and extract this information and could give you then the exact information that you need to be the best you can. So you're too optimistic, I think, and this is really nice, but as we are moving into the future, which is very uncertain, what are some challenges to learning? Like you, we've mentioned metaverse, are, there are set of opportunities, but what are the challenges? Um, well, what I do believe is, is always there is uh, GDPR. So um, data privacy, cybersecurity, how can you make sure that your digital twin uh, does not get hijacked. I mean, we hear it all the time that things are happening to avatars. How do you make sure that it really mirrors yourself? Um, plus, you could then really look into why not have a digital twin in, in the healthcare arena, not only in education, but this digital twin would have all your healthcare data. And there, I do believe that is really where we need to be very careful with regards to cybersecurity, with regards to data privacy, um, and a topic that is oftentimes forgotten, but um, I do believe it's very, very important is the ethical aspect that we should not forget if we are talking about that. In the end, it's still about the human being. I think that the, the ethics and governance aspect should always be the, uh, the governing uh, component in this journey. And I would like just to remind our audience that they could drop their questions in the Q&A tab, and we will be happy to pick them. Feel free to drop them in English, Arabic, or French. We have a team who is interpreting them. I'll make sure to relay them with our speaker. So we, we spoke about the metaphors and some technologies, but what are some new technology learning technologies in the horizon? Um, so at the moment, I'm really looking into quantum computing. We have not yet touched AI and how AI could help uh, the individual learning path, but just imagine how many different information and input layers you do have to really find the best learning path for every individual that makes learning really a positive experience, most efficient and effective. And here I do believe AI could already help a lot um, if you have um, the search engines of this world, they are using AI, but how can you make AI even more effective and efficient? How can you train your AI? And that is, I believe, where quantum computing and the sheer power of computing could absolutely help because you have all these different input layers that sometimes are even overwhelming for artificial intelligence. Yeah? So the combination of those two technologies I personally, at least, do believe will really make a difference um, in the future. So besides the technologies and the ways of, of, of transforming our learning experiences, be it uh, at, the, at the education institution or corporate level, how did the pandemic affect the learning journey? Why weren't we able to, uh, to perceive, the, perceive it before coming? And how are we preparing for the future to mitigate the emergence of such uh, pandemics? That's an excellent question. Sorry that we haven't talked about that earlier because definitely the pandemic has had a tremendous impact on how we are educating at the moment. 
So I would say it has accelerated how we learn at least a couple of years. Before the pandemic, we were pretty much sticking to the classroom, the in-person setup. And during the pandemic, we had to learn how can we train healthcare professionals who could not spend time in the classroom or who might not even be at, at uh, that place at the time. So that is why I do believe that the pandemic, and it was really, really, really bad, but a crisis, at least in Chinese characters, has always the second character as it means opportunity. And I do believe that this opportunity in learning and educating was that we could really transition way, way faster from in classroom to digital learning. Without the pandemic, the openness to pe from people to try sitting in a virtual classroom, sitting in front of a, a laptop or probably even trying VR would not be that fast as we do see it right now after the pandemic. So can learners experiment virtually? Could they experiment and live the same experience that they live in labs? You've mentioned frequently the virtual uh, reality, the labs, but can uh, learners experiment virtually as well? Could they have the same experience as experimenting in a physical lab? I would say yes and no. So um, the curiosity that um, is then created by experiments is also possible in the virtual space. I'm not sure if you have tried virtual reality for the audience. I'm skeptical about it. For the audience who, who has tried, it is incredible how fast your brain believes that it's kind of real and you are in this kind of environment. So I can talk from my own experience. I was walking around virtual chairs. I knew I could just pass through them because they were virtual. I was dropping my handholds on virtual tables and they were falling to the floor because I thought it's a table. Probably uh, this is really beginner's mistakes. I don't know, <laughs> but um, it, it felt awfully real. Yeah, and the same is true if you are in, in the hybrid operating room and you have your patient there and you're taking care of that patient it it really feels like you are there and it's about this patient's life so there you can experiment what can you do what is the process steps could you jump process steps what if you arrange the hybrid or personnel in a different way how can you optimize also your protocols um, another important, I believe, factor here is, for instance, um, the smart simulators. It's digital twins. We have been talking about digital twins if it comes to education or healthcare. But imagine we now have digital twins of our systems, imaging systems, for instance, or lab diagnostic systems in the cloud. So you could already familiarize yourself with the user interface, even though the system is not yet there. And you could standardize protocols. You could try protocols without downtime, uh, without you know putting a patient on jeopardy, all digitally in the cloud. So this is what I really do believe. Experimenting, coming back to your question, yeah, experimenting is super important for education. It is possible. Nevertheless, I do believe in the strengths of a hybrid approach. So having then a real patient in front of you, having hands-on training, is very, very important. Maybe also our, uh, our virtual audience in the, in the virtual space. If you would want to share with us your thoughts on the virtual reality, if you have tried it before, please do in the Q&A. Maybe we could also reflect it, whether, whether it was a pleasant one or not with our speaker. So another question, maybe linking the learning organization with the customers. So could you walk us through the learning value chain from the organization and how could a customer feel it? Um, absolutely, because that is how we develop our education experience, always thinking um, from the position of the customer. What does a customer need? So <laughs> unfortunately, I have not now uh, the slide with me, but it's um, I, I try to explain it because it's really um, it's intriguing and it's easy. So imagine you are a healthcare professional and you have ordered, um, let's take a CT scanner. Yeah, and you do not know your way around a CT scanner. 
So what we are doing is we could already train the customer, the MTRAs, medical technical assistance, for instance, um, virtually that they know what to do once the system is installed. We have had 100% virtual handovers already if it comes to computer tomography and the healthcare professionals using it, they were trained up front. They could use the smart simulator in the clouds. They were using um, the virtual classrooms still. And this is, I believe, really about the customer experience, what is so important. Should you feel this is not enough? Of course, we come to your place and we have our specialists, our trainers there for individual questions to support you really on site. And then this entire circle starts because like a life cycle yeah, of the product, you also have the life cycle of the education. You get software updates that sometimes you need to train. You have attrition at the customer side. Um, the techs, they change like in every industry. So you need to retrain them. You need to get them on board. So then the lifelong learning journey really starts with us taking care of the skilling of our customers. Wow, super interesting and impactful, I guess. How about, what about sustainability? How is this transformative journey sustainable? If you would want to take it from a climate change perspective or from an inclusivity perspective, are you leaving anyone behind? Are we leaving anyone behind if we, we take this journey? Because I think that the approaches that you have been applying lately uh, we, we still have people who do not have access to education, uh, who do not get uh, adequate or decent job opportunities. So do you think this uh, new approach that you are adopting can mitigate and reduce uh, all these gaps and disparities? Well, I very much hope so that it, uh, it can, yeah, because that is why we are really working on that. And there comes the learning culture into play, what we have um, touched at the very beginning. Education learning material content should be democratized it should not make any difference whether you sit here with us in frankfurt germany or you sit in lebanon or you sit in uh, abu dhabi or in vietnam or in the us people must have access to the educational content and that is where i do believe the digitalization really helps to get access to get people access to education that have not had this opportunity before. Might it be in very remote areas or in emerging countries, no matter if you are male, if you are female. So this is where I do believe um, we really have taken a, a huge leap forward if it comes to um, education and really the contribution of educational content. But if I'm not mistaken, your question was uh, double folded, yeah. right? So you also ask about the sustainability if it comes to probably a green footprint. And this topic is um, really dear to my heart because that challenge, if it comes to CO2 emission, we could also address that by going digital. So imagine you would fly people from one classroom to another classroom to another classroom or from one hospital. I'm, I'm talking about the trainers now yeah? or also the customers. It is, it is tons of CO2 that you could really um, avoid. If I'm not mistaken, it's nearly 30,000 tons, uh, let alone the past year, just by going digital. So that is another component that yet adds to why we would really need to change our way of how we are training. Yeah? You know, but with the ma massive acceleration and generation of knowledge, the digital divide is not being narrowed at the same pace. So aren't people, you know, in, in certain regions or in certain countries left behind, will they be able to, to, to catch up the, like the trend? And now with COVID, we have seen like globally, the indicators are not doing well. We're not on track. So should we work in parallel using traditional approaches and this very optimistic and transformative approach? Should it be an integrated approach? What do you think? I think we shouldn't stop the classic approach, right? Because uh, <laughs> otherwise there would be nothing. What is really interesting and what I would answer to that question is that we do see paradigm shifts now 
way more quickly than in the past. If you think back centuries, humans settled, then we jump. You have um, the industrialization. It took two to three generations to digest. Nowadays, you have a couple of paradigm shifts in just one generation. So you question how can they um, speed up or catch up? I, I don't believe that this dynamic is what we will see in the future because of these tremendous speed of change, they can start at a different point and they will be on top with um, the ones who probably have been through education their entire life because we need to learn how to learn. Probably even you and my generation, yeah, uh, we went to school, to university, then we started our job and we are maybe or maybe not in the same industry. In the future, studies say that a person will work in 17 different jobs across five different industries. See, so you would need to learn new skills. You will forget other skills. So the learning, the relearning, and also the forgetting is very, very important. And that is why I do believe there will be an equalization in the knowledge, in the skills because of the speed of the new technologies and the paradigm shifts that we do see um, out there in the market. Then what's your message on where does learning happen and how does learning happen? Is there a definite answer to this? I would say yes. And the answer is everywhere. So just by talking to you, I learn. I hope you learn. <laughs> Definitely learning and enjoying this discussion. <laughs> <laughs> and our listeners um, also do learn. So it doesn't stop. And your roles will change over life. So you are first a son. Yeah, then you are a boyfriend, then you are um, a husband, then you are a father and an uncle, a manager, um, an interviewer. Uh, so you learn your entire life. And that is how our brains, how our human uh nature is we are hardwired for learning our entire lives and maybe it's a little bit scientific but why not yeah so there is now also studies that indicate that the brain plasticity does not stop when you are an adult we were to think that only children have very high brain plasticity because they learn so much in such a short uh, time frame and for us adults it's more challenging um, now studies show that also our brain plasticity could be accelerated because we don't learn that much like a toddler. If we would learn to learn, it's possible. And that is something I personally, I find really reassuring that we can learn everywhere, every time we go out and we can be educators because even if you don't realize it, but as a brother, as a husband, as a father, you are a teacher all the time. Yeah, so you just naturally do it. Uh, indeed, and and you mentioned lifelong learning in the presentation. So, what's your message to adults? You know, I think young people, if you would want to reflect on the system, it's meant for them to learn at school, at university, and then. But for those who are in their fifties and sixties, and their perception about learning. So what are your thoughts on lifelong learning and adult learning and reintegrating them in the new future of jobs and skills? Yeah, um, there again, I do believe it's the individual. You can't force anyone to learn. That is what we probably all have experienced at school. If you have your math teacher there and he wants you to do algebra and you just didn't like it, you were more into biology. It's very hard to learn stuff that you are not interested in. So it's about knowing yourself, knowing what you are interested in, what you want to know. Yeah. And then it, it really is kind of easy to learn and to adopt to new technologies. And it's not only that we do learn how to use new technologies. It's also that new technologies teach us yeah, how to learn, for instance. So maybe your question was going into that direction. Um, very senior people, not digital natives, having challenges working resisting. with resisting Sorry? change, you know, yeah. the resistance to change and learning. Yeah, how we could address this one? So, 
I think the human nature plays in because we are curious. Yeah. And seriously, um, I could bet that many, many grandmothers now learn how to Skype or how to Zoom just to see their grandchildren and to talk to their families. Um, and this is the intrinsic motivation of us humans, I believe, that will overcome this, oh, I'm, I'm intimidated by new technologies, maybe I embarrass myself, yeah? But the benefit that will result is the motivation that really helps you jump over this barrier and indulge into learning. And this would take us back to the value that these new technologies and the which is definitely uh, comes from the originates from the learning. You know, these technologies out out there because there was a learning journey for a certain client or a company that has led to this the creation of a, a new product or a new service. Here, I would maybe ask my colleagues if you could could they give me some questions from the audience. Uh, I have dropped my iPad somewhere, Liliam or Stephanie, if you could share please with me the questions. Meanwhile, I'll get the opportunity to ask you one more question. Uh, what about quality education and quality learning? Like you've mentioned there's hundreds or millions of courses and MOOCs online and pieces of information, but what about quality learning? Well, let's not say education learning, it's a, it's a broader sense. Yeah. Um, and here I really do believe it's about finding the right information for you that you need at that moment. Learning is more than just training, uh, than just learning of facts. It's training the mind how to think. I'm not sure if, if you saw that. That is one of my favorite quotes from um, Einstein. But that is really what I do believe is very important. Looking now into healthcare. I do believe it's imperative to have high quality trainings and to also update the training content on an extremely regular basis to make sure that the care that is taken is always top notch. Wow. That's super interesting. So let me, uh, we have several questions from the audience. Uh, so there's a question which is interesting that international organizations today tend to classify countries in terms of education, economy, and sustainable development. Are there education training courses through which the evaluation is carried out? So from your perspective, how could we measure uh, the learning journey in a company, not just at the uh, you know, at education institutions or universities? Should you have a matrix in place <laughs> to encourage it other companies to do so? It's very hard to answer that question because there is definitely different standards also um, if it comes to procedures and to regulations. Yeah. Nevertheless, I do believe what is important is also the testing. And that is how we, uh, as humans, we learn. And we must try not to learn just for one test. Probably you have had that in university. You know, okay, the finals are due and you learn, learn, learn. And afterwards you forget. So what I really do believe is important um, to standardize and to always ask yourself, yeah, and, and to really challenge yourself, could you pass this test again? I mean, we could imagine that there is a global um, standard for certain jobs. For instance, in medicine for medical doctors, you do have to go through tests if you as a German doctor want to work in the US to make sure that you know what you are doing. So um, it, it's for me hypothetical, but why not? Well, I like how optimistic you are about learning. <laughs> so we have another question about uh, the virtual uh, reality. So the question says, does virtual reality create isolation for the learner from the reality of life and the real sensory experience? So he lives in imagination and creates feelings of distance from people. So the question here is about interaction. So you mentioned that there are interactions out there in the virtual space, but are they real? And what they create, like there are opportunities, but do you think in the future, be it the near or long future, will we be um, addressing some more serious problems, even that now we are benefit benefiting from certain opportunities? I do think this is really a great question because um, here also the ethics comes into play, I do believe. Plus, and I can't strengthen that enough, um, our human nature. We are social beings. We need to have this direct social interaction. And I believe um, COVID taught us 
that isolation um, is not always good for everyone, also from our psyche. So the question is how often and how extensively you do it. If you are losing yourself completely in virtual realities, which I, I put it um, in my example, is super easy. Yeah? Um, and you don't have contact with real people. I think that could be really dangerous yeah, because you also don't get that kind of personal feedback. Nevertheless, coming back to the hybrid approach, that is where I really do believe the value lies. And that is what for us as persons is the best way to really digest what we have learned. We learn from each other. So all the learning experience platforms, they now created spaces where you can have peer-to-peer -peer learning. Because looking back centuries, yeah, um, Aristotle's, one teacher, probably five students. Then you go into um, our times today, you have one professor, thousands of students. Then you put this whole thing digital, one professor, millions of students. And now just imagine those students, the millions could teach millions and interact. So I really do believe this social component is very, very important and we must not underestimate. So my, my um, opinion is not lose yourself only in virtual reality, really have this hybrid approach, real world and um, virtual reality. Last, there was one more question hidden in that question. I think it was with regards to the haptic feedback, right? Um, because this is something um, I have been thinking and experiencing myself, especially um, as a surgeon. We have discussed this question, how important is it to get the haptic feedback if you cut an eyeball or if you cut skin, for instance? And interestingly enough, Haptic feedback, um, you have these gloves that could, uh, you know, give you that kind of haptic feedback, or at least it tries. It is good to have. Nevertheless, what you are practicing in VR is also the process steps that you know if you do your operation, what you do first, second, third, what are the steps that you are really familiar with that, that you are confident and confident in what you are doing. The haptic feedback was what we found also the feedback that we got from surgeons is more or less secondary because once you have operated it, you do know it and you can translate it. So the translation of skills and knowledge from virtual reality into reality is very mature in us humans. Super interesting. So we have several questions from our uh, virtual audience I'm trying to keep up with the messages as they come. <laughs> this is why I'm looking uh, at my phone. I'm really sorry for that. There's one very, very, very interesting question. And okay. I think by that, maybe we could conclude because we're running out of time. So back to adults and the resistance to learning and so on. So uh, one of our audience mentions, it's so important for us as adults to keep learning, but can we do it? Uh, but can we do it if we would, do not get the opportunity to apply what we learn in the virtual world? Don't you think it will be frustrating and how can you ever overcome such obstacles? Okay, um, so you learn something and then you can't apply it in the job. Then for me, the question would be, why do you learn? <laughs> if you're probably, if you are self-motivated to have this experience, um, great. I mean, I have done things in VR that is not my job and I've, I found it really interesting. I have done technical training for engineers as, yeah. as a surgeon or medical doctor. I, I don't really use it, but I wanted to have this experience um, and I really immersed myself into VR. I, I learned, I got that skills. I could never use it. Nevertheless, also this is a process of learning and it shows you, do you need it? Don't you need it? Where can you maybe really translate that skills? I believe every learning experience is an enrichment and try not to get frustrated if you can't immediately apply it in your job. Wow, so we do not only learn for a job, right? So what are your final remarks, Janina, before we conclude? <laughs> Anthony, I would um, recommend to everyone to stay curious yeah, and really immerse oneself into learning and lifelong learning and have fun with it.
And by that, we, we, we would reach the end of our session for today. And uh, this is the last session for the day. Tomorrow we'll be starting with, uh, we will be starting our day at one with two new sessions. Stay tuned and you can catch us on our social media accounts, Knowledge for All. And until tomorrow, keep learning. Thank you. Thank Bye. you very much. Bye-bye.